John Crowder here. I am with Matt Spinks, and we're trying a little something different here on the Jesus Trip this week. We're having a Skype interview, so uh, it is possible that the quality may not be quite as HD as normal since we're recording through Skype, but the content is going to be really good, and I'm excited to have Matt here. I've known Matt for years, and Matt is uh, drunk. He is a gospel lover, and Matt has actually been part of our Cana New Wine Seminary as well, which, as you guys know, uh, is an online course. Would actually encourage you guys if you enjoy what you hear from Matt this week, uh, be part of it. It kicks off at the end of October. You can sign up, be an online student, and be a certified drunken theologian. But I, I really want to chat with Matt this week, uh, just to start off. And this is going to be more conversational this week. I want to talk a little bit about your new book. Matt just came out with a book high on God, and it's about ecstatic experience and the presence of God. So why don't you just kick it off, Matt? Tell us a little bit about the book and your thought behind it. Yeah, well, thanks, John. Uh, It's an honor to be here with you, and it's it's been an honor to be a part of Cana. It's been been hammered. It's glorious. Uh, Yeah, so uh, John has also uh, given me the opportunity to share a little bit about my book, uh, High on God, here. And uh, it's, it's just a lot of story of kind of what my wife and I have uh, experienced over the last uh, decade or so. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been awesome. And it just, just, you know, so many times when we show up to minister somewhere, there's just so many questions, you know, what is this joy? What is this? Uh, what's going on here? Why are these people laughing more than they're crying? Uh, you know, stuff like that. So uh, it took me six or seven years to sort through uh sort through a lot of uh, my own thoughts and I'm not really a, a writer, but uh, yeah, we, we, we cranked out a book there and um, should I just jump into it, John? Uh, share a little yeah. bit. You mind if I share a summary or whatever? Absolutely. That'd be awesome. Sweet. Yeah. Well, uh, for those of you that don't know us, the book kind of gives a little bit of uh, our history. And then also, you know, um, just, just as John has, has already done with his, you know, uh, ecstasy of loving God and, and a number of other resources that he's put out over the years. I mean, we just wanted to flood, you know, the airwaves and flood the, uh, flood the pages with, with more revelation on what it means to be, uh, jacked up on Jesus, you know, to, to experience, um, you know, something that, that shouldn't just be for a few random people throughout the ages, but something that uh, is normal and, and, uh, it's, you know, the bliss of salvation is, is meant for everyone. Amen. So, so yeah, um, we, we put out that book last year and we've been doing a tour, just kind of going different places to, to promote that. But, uh, you know, so I'm just going to read you a little bit of the table of contents. I've got, a have just got my book cracked open here and because, you know, I, I never thought I'd be someone, uh, you know, out, out promoting my products or trying to sell a book, but I, I just believe in the message. You know, I, I believe, kind of the thought behind it was uh, I remember being 18 years old and being strung out on drugs myself and having a conversation with a buddy where I said, wouldn't it be amazing? It doesn't seem like it should be possible that we can get more jacked up on God than on all these drugs that we were doing. Like if God is real, you know, I I literally remember having a conversation on a beach with a buddy saying like, uh, if God is real, I mean, it should be able to like, there's got to be something greater than just this, uh, you know, this blunt we're smoking, this, uh, these pills we've been popping. And, uh, obviously there's so much more to God than that. But, um, in our book, you know, chapter one, we kind of go through, uh, just our, our history of when, uh, it was the year 2008 when we first just started to experience this glory through a, a number of divine appointments with, with friends that, you know, I was, I was actually in the religious church for a while, um, from, from kind of 2001 to 2008, I spent about seven years being the, the good boy, you know, doing all the things they tell you to do. I was fasting, praying. I went to the nations. I lived in a hut in India, you know, uh, I was, you know, trying to save the, save the planet, you know? And, uh, yet a lot of that time was just, you know, it was all fire, fire, you know, pressure and, and, you know, do the stuff, you know? And I, honestly just didn't feel a lot of joy. Uh, I'd hear God maybe rarely, 
um, you know, I'd read about miracles in the Bible, but rarely see them. And even the missionaries I was working with, so many of them were burning out and going home. And, you know, their goal for the year was just to survive another year, you know. And so, but in 2008, uh, people started to share with me that uh, Jesus actually opened the heavens and uh, the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom and the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. And my God, that's, those could just sound like words, but when you begin to experience the realities of them, it changed everything for us. And uh, our first chapter is just kind of telling that story. We, my wife and I used to have, you know, we'd try to do like an hour of prayer each day together. And our, our little prayer time just, you know, we just came together after hearing this message and experiencing the whack. And we just smile and laugh. And we, did, we said we didn't even know what to pray for anymore. It feels like everything's already here. And uh, so... <laughs> So that was a little bit of kind of the first chapter of it. And uh, chapter two, we go through what do you mean by high on God? It's kind of, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, were we just high on life? What, what exactly are you talking about? We talk about, you know, the manifestations, what it, what it feels like, what it's done, you know. Um, and it's not just, uh, you know, a little smile on your face, but you can go into day, days on end trances. You could be, you know, just uh, just lit. I mean, and yeah, anyway. It goes in more depth in that chapter two. Chapter three, we go through, it's called High on the Bible. We go through how this stuff is actually biblical, that we're this high because we read our Bibles, not because we're just trying to have some, ex, you know, extra biblical ecstatic experience. Um, chapter four, which is one of my favorites, which I want to pick your brain a little bit on. Uh, it's just, it's called High, uh, the High View of Theology or a High View of Theology. And uh, that's where I think John is ex excelling in these days is really, um, helping some of the ecstatics to be rooted and grounded in what is the drink, you know, that it is Jesus. And so hope to ask you a couple questions about that in a minute, John, but um, sure. uh, chapter five is called the psychology of the bliss. We talk about how you were wired to be happy, how you don't have to feel bad about feeling good. Chapter six is a God high through history. We go through some of the ecstatics of the ages and talk about how this isn't just something that started in Toronto. It's uh, not just something that uh, a few weirdos are doing, but it's, uh, you know, even Sarah Edwards, the wife of Jonathan Edwards, was a ecstatic who would, you know, uh, involuntarily leap and fall over and pass out in the glory of God. You know, it's tons of stories throughout history. Brother Lawrence, you know, uh, Teresa Avia. Chapter seven, I call How to Get High, which is kind of a misnomer because uh, half the chapter is talking about how there is no how to. But uh, it's all about just focusing on who rather than how. Um Chapter eight's a high future, kind of removing some of these negative eschatologies, how the whack is actually just kind of washed away all of our expectation of, of negativity and wrath and judgment on this planet. But uh, yeah, they check that out. Chapter nine, we tell a bunch of stories we've experienced over the years. Uh, man, we've seen, I mean, we had a, we had a friend who got uh, put in a paddy wagon and taken to the ER because they thought he was uh, overdosing, you know, it's this crazy story that we've seen. <laughs> I think, I think that was at one of my meetings when that it happened. Was, it was, John. <laughs> yeah. Actually a lot of, a lot of my favorite times have happened around a John Crowder meeting. I'll be honest with y'all. We recount some of those. John's, John's uh, definitely enhanced our bliss, you know, uh, you know, we also in the high stories talk about how marriages have been healed and how, you know, this bliss, because you're satisfied, you're not a controlling person, you're not a manipulator. And some of my favorite testimonies are just relational healing and stuff that's happened in the bliss, too. You know, sometimes people just want to hear about angel feathers and gold dust, but uh, it's a lot more to that, uh, more than that. Um, chapter 10 is how to stay high, which we kind of redefine the spiritual disciplines and just talk about how what, what is, can be uh, known as a discipline could also just be known as how to party. You know, that, uh, that, that prayer and Bible study and, and uh, serving and all that stuff is just the, the, the most high way to live. Um, chapter 11, we talk about common questions and misconceptions. Have you ever had any of those, John? Uh, misconceptions regarding your ministry? I don't we know. get the occasional, <laughs> the occasional misconception <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it's actually the longest chapter in my book. Believe it or not. <laughs> no doubt. To, yeah, I try to make it a resource, you know, for uh, you know, people are like, how could I? If you're hammered all the time, how do you go to work? Um, if you or isn't being hammered on Jesus uh, irresponsible or a shallow form of Christianity? Uh, you know, we answer a bunch of questions like that. How do you how do you deal with suffering? in this bliss, if you're high all the time or whatever. 
So um, chapter 12, we talk about uh, community life, which is a passion of mine. Just got back from a weekend, our, our yearly weekend gathering this last weekend of, of uh, gathering communities that are learning how to, to do church in a different way. Um, when you realize that everybody's, you know, holy and filled with goodness, um, church kind of changes from a from trying to control and programatize people to to more of an empowerment model. Uh, chapter three, I talk about beyond. Or I mean, chapter thirteen. Sorry, I talk about beyond Christian boxes. How Jesus is present in in you know everywhere, and uh, how we can gather some different, even some ecstatic resources from other parts without syncretism and without becoming a, a weird cult. But uh, it's an interesting chapter. And then the last chapter of my book, thank you for bearing with me, John, as I did a long overview. Here, oh, that's but, great. Uh, the last chapter is just devotional meditations. And, um, you know, a lot of people are like, I wish I had some New Covenant devotional material. So I had a, a, a few friends write devos and we put those in the last chapter, just things you can read to yourself or read out loud in a group that uh, could enhance your bliss, bliss readings. And uh, so that's kind of the overall summary, you know. Um, and I really appreciate you giving me time, man, because uh, I really just want to encourage people to get that book, you know, and if you're like, well, I, you know, I, don't, I hate when people pimp their product. If you can't afford a book, send me a message, but uh, 15 bucks is worth it. And uh, I really just want to spread these all, all across the land to say, you know, there's, there's 50 million people getting high on drugs today. And, and it's so few people experiencing the free gift of the glory of God that we've been given in Christ. And, uh, makes every drug look like decaf coffee in Jesus yeah. name. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think one of the the biggest uh misconceptions out there is is just that people have cut their teeth in modern American evangelicalism. Yes. So they don't have a grid for any type of ecstatic experience. They don't see the yes. apostle Paul uh continually uh having these crazy ecstatic encounters with John in Revelation 1 or or uh, Peter. All throughout, yeah, all throughout That's the scriptures, it. isn't it? Yeah, it's all throughout the scriptures, and it's all throughout church history. I mean, even when you begin to talk about the church mystics, people think you know the word mystic, all the, the red flags. Yeah, go up, right. That word yeah. is is so associated with the occult today uh, that people think you're talking about crystal balls and Ouija boards and flying exactly. brooms, whatever. But all throughout church history, I mean, every great awakening, you had people that were tangibly encountering the presence of God. And I think one of the things that uh, we, we probably got in a bit of trouble uh, over the years for, and something that I don't regret at all because it was very intentional, <laughs> was the, the language, put, you know, putting things yeah. into common vernacular. Because when you use terminology like intoxication, which is actually a, a biblical term, I mean, Holy Spirit is referred to as wine, the love of God exactly. is the line of the new covenant that we're talking about, there's this transcendence. Um, and really what we're talking about essentially is the practice of the presence of God. Yes. And if God really is good, and I don't mean good for you like cough medicine, but really good, <laughs> like gummy bears, then uh, you, you begin to realize we're, we're created for pleasure. You know, God made Adam and Eve, put them in a garden, Eden. Eden means pleasure. We're, we're created for those rivers of pleasure that flow from his right hand. He is our satisfaction. It's, it's a, a resonance that's within all of humanity, just longing for fulfillment, satisfaction that, that only comes from yes. him. And this is not, as you said, some foreign experience that's reserved for just a few hermits in a, in a cave somewhere, but this is our daily bread. The, the, um, so I think throughout church history, you've had a lot of different terminology. And so to, to put this in, in vernacular for today, where people can associate, you know, this, this high, this bliss, this ecstasy, uh, all throughout church history, you had different terminology for it. And, and different denominations have had uh, a paradigm for it. You know, if you look at the, yeah. the Orthodox or the Catholic, they call it contemplation. Uh, yes. Uh, people that shakers were, and Quakers. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> there have always been people who had this tangible, subjective experience of their union with God. And, and, and the thing is, it, it is all rooted in an already existent ontological yes. union with God. In our being, all humanity is united to God thanks to the incarnation of Jesus. We are in God in the last yes. Adam. It doesn't mean we know it, and it doesn't mean we necessarily like it, okay, because we've got some issues. But, but when we realize the truth is that those issues have been settled, we realize the truth. Yes. You said the heavens have been opened. Every, come on, come on. every uh, 
distance has been bridged. Um, you know, I, yeah. I think we just need to see people getting acclimatized to the, the reality that this is our portion to enjoy God, to, to as the, the Westminster Catechism says, we're, our chief end, the chief purpose of man is to enjoy God and glorify him forever. And Imagine so this, that. Yeah, this enjoyment, I mean, what is the essence of love? Love is not just duty. You know, DC talk yes. was wrong. Love is not just washing yes. the dishes. Love may wash <laughs> the dishes, but love really is love. It is desire. It is delight. And and this yes. is what people crave. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited that you guys have been running with this for years and you've got so many people in your community that um, they're, they're tuned in to the, to the awareness of, of God's presence. And I, I think it is uh, so key to, to, to really help people to realize the source of this bliss. Where yes. does this come yes. from? Because throughout the ages you've had, or, or at least the past hundred years since the Pentecostal movement, you've had people that are aware of the presence of God. They are aware of that tangible glory and this experience that they can have. And yet, as we know, it so often devolves into these legalistic formulas and steps and yeah. uh, self-deprecation to try to beat yourself up to, to, to enter into something. Whereas yeah. the gospel says you're already in thanks to Jesus. And so it, it, as we come into this gospel awareness, uh, this is where I, I believe um, we really zero in and, and hit the target. Absolutely, man. Yeah, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's funny, just just the language like you were talking about high on God or intoxicating. You know, I, I, I love it. And, and at first, it's, I think, offensive to the serious believer, the serious Christian, because we, you know, well, for so many of the reasons you mentioned there, we've often just been so focused on, we think God's this hard to please God that we've got to, you know, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and get serious rather than an enjoyment paradigm, rather than a union and a love paradigm. Uh, and, and, uh, but I love the language because for me, you know, the average person on the street, uh, so far often thinks that God isn't, you know, anything real or tangible. They think, you know, there's this concept, this ethereal thing. And when we say, Hey, you know, I experienced God at like in, I mean, I'll use a, a little analogy. Like you had a few too many drinks. Well, wait, you, and all of a sudden there's this, this concept that, wow, maybe like it could actually affect my real life, my body, my consciousness, my awareness. And, uh, and so, yeah, you know, obviously if they're watching your stuff, they're already familiar with this, but, uh, you know, it never hurts to like, ex you know, to, to just re-mention again that, uh, you know, experiencing God is just as real. There was a whole room filled with marijuana smoke. Everybody's going to get high. It's not a personality type. The whole earth is flooded with the glory of God. And when we realize that anybody and everybody can experience it. So, yeah. but like you were mentioning the theological stuff, I, I'd love to pick your brain a little bit. Um, something that's been so alive to me is, uh, is, I mean, just... I mean, the person of Jesus, you know, I think that's that's all this whack has, has just led me more and more in love with Jesus and seeing that the Sunday school answer is so much more rich than we ever imagined that really to every question, the answer is Jesus to every, you know, to any any area we want to grow in. It's all about Jesus. And so um, but Jesus as the vicarious man has really been like a phrase just resonating in my spirit. And uh, I've, I've done a number of messages on it just recently, but I'd love to just kind of pick your brain. Like when you, and, and I'll just say why maybe um, what I love right now about this vicarious man reality is that, uh, you know, I, I want to experience God 24 seven. Like I know that I was, you know, um, I think part of the thing over the last hundred years that you're mentioning is people thought they had to come in and out of the presence or during worship, you know, even our old worship sets were set up to lead them in to the presence, you know, to start with high praise and lead them into worship. And finally they get into the glory, you know, but, uh, what we're experiencing in Jesus with this revelation of Jesus and that is that we're actually always in him and that he's always in us. And I think um, understanding the incarnation and the vicarious like nature of uh, of being in him um, and all that we have in him has really uh, empowered me to stay in that bliss, to stay in that awareness. And, and not just so I can be high, but also so I can always be in love. I can always be in joy and I always have peace and patience and all the fruits are manifesting effortlessly. 
But I've noticed so much of it, like the security in my own heart to live in that, to walk in that continuously has just ex- exponentially grown as I realize this vicarious man. So when I, when I say that phrase, John, what, it, what, what do you, what would you say? What is this vicarious man? Well, the, the, vi- the vicarious <laughs> humanity of Jesus Christ is the gospel. And uh, this, this glory this, that we're talking about has a face. <laughs> he's a, he's a person. Uh, Jesus Christ is the manifestation of the glory of God. Um, this this term, and I, I think it is important for people. Yeah. Uh, whenever we bring up a term like the vicarious humanity of Christ, I think it is important to reference where that term comes from. Yes. Uh, and and it, it comes from uh, the 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 Torrance family of theologians. And uh, T. F. Torrance is the guy who who most publicized this this phrase. There you go. I got my I got my Torrance book right here. There you go. But it, you know, it was actually it was actually uh, J. B. Torrance who who really first came up with this terminology. It was just that he, you know, he didn't write much, and and T. F. Torrance is kind of known for writing about it. But the, the concept of Christ's vicarious humanity is that he is humanity in our place. And in a very mystical way, we are woven yeah. into the humanity of Jesus Christ. And so often what we are given is a sort of a WWJD, what would Jesus do message? You know, what yes. we need to do to <laughs> emulate Christ, or Christ is an example of what we need to do to, I don't know, suffer and die and get closer to God or something. But in reality, Jesus didn't just come as our example. He, he came as our substitute. He stepped into our place, and his humanity is our humanity. His death was our death. His resurrection was our resurrection. Uh, his faith is our faith. Yes. His acts of repentance are our acts of repentance. His baptism in the River Jordan is our baptism. His circumcision on the eighth day is the circumcision of the entire world. We are all included Come in on. the last Adam. So Jesus is both the, the subject and the object of faith. He is the God in which faith is placed in, but he's also the man who has faith in God as us, for us. And, um, you, you know, we, we kind of have the idea, I think, in the church, most, most evangelicals realize that we don't need to be legalistic and follow the law to get into heaven, but we still right. think there are certain things we need to do, like a hidden fee, a surcharge. Yeah tacked on to the gift of grace. And the biggest one of all is this idea, well, you still have to believe it, or you've got to repent. You've got to live right after you you hear it in order to prove to somebody that you believe it. But it's killing people, really. You know, you see so many testimonies of people who are just so struggling because of that that thing. Absolutely. I mean, how much faith is enough? As we often say, do you you need faith until you get a goose bump? Uh, Do you have enough faith that you you know can walk through walls, walk on water? How much do you repent? Do you stop beating your wife? I mean, how much is it becomes this subjective rubber ruler, and it's very humanistic. And 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 what we end up preaching is faith in faith itself. And and in reality, Jesus is uh, he is the substance. As as so many guys have been saying over the years, the gospel does not demand faith. The gospel supplies faith. It's in hearing yes. this union and this oneness that I have that faith begins to spring up. Arises. Yeah, yeah that, that's it. So uh, with this vicarious humanity perspective, we realize that Jesus vicariously believes the Father for us as us. He perfectly follows the law where we failed and never could fulfill the law. And I think a lot of evangelicals, they do get that aspect. They do get the aspect that Jesus fulfilled the law for us. Yeah. He actually fulfilled the law. There's even more to it. Oh, so yeah. much more. I mean, because yeah. he also had perfect faith for us as us. As a matter of fact, uh, as you know, I mean, almost every verse that, that speaks about faith in Jesus in. Christ has, yeah. has been mistranslated. It, it's the faith of Jesus Christ. It's his faithfulness. And so... This concept of his vicarious humanity tells us that salvation isn't just something he did. Union isn't just something he pulled off. But in his very incarnate being, in the hypostatic union of his divinity and humanity, Jesus is our place of union with God. And we are in his humanity right now, woven into the Trinity, sat right into the heart of the Trinity. And from his 
from his very birth, I mean, into the, the scandal of an unwed mother. I mean, he entered into the reproach of our human dysfunction. He who did not need to be baptized was vicariously yes. baptized for us and as us. And in his baptism, the world was baptized. You know, the last Adam who vicariously represents the entire human race. And, um, you know, I think people, people to some degree, evangelicals, get the idea that everything that happened to the first Adam happened to all of us. The fall right. affects all of yeah. us. But, but man, everything— <laughs> For some that, reason. Yeah. Yeah, but everything that happened to Christ, could that happen to all of us? And so what we do is we, we give Adam so much credit. Adam is a human being able to affect the entire human race. But how we balk at the notion that everything that occurred in Jesus Christ could affect the entire human race. And, and people just— yes. You know, jump to these conclusions that you're a universalist or you're saying all dogs go to heaven. And those are conversations we can have. But we have to realize that, you know, he who committed no sin stepped into the guise of sinful humanity, into the dilapidated framework of the fallen human existence. And from day one, he was beating back into alignment my malfunctioning human will so that I can live seamlessly and effortlessly in full synergy with God. And, and this is the source of our bliss. It tells us that there is no separation, no more than there could be a separation between his divinity and his humanity. To, to yes. even to even conjecture that we're separate from God is to say that Jesus Christ is a schizo, that, that his humanity and his divinity are separate. It rejects the very incarnation. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I could talk about this for ages. This is what no, gets me so jacked good. up. This is, this is the, no, exactly. the foundation. It's the spout where the glory comes out, for Come sure. Come on, dude. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I've been getting really jacked on this uh, reality, obviously, you know, for years. But it, And it's so funny because there's different uh, aspects of Jesus to, to kind of meditate on. But this vicarious reality has been has been really impacting me lately, especially in just— you know, uh, give me such security in my bliss, like such security just in my experience of God. It's like I've found so many, you know, more glory encounters in a way, you know, although encounters is always a funny word, but just experiences or whatever of our union sure. is uh, just so, you know, just such a settledness because and, and here's, you know, this might be a way because I, I feel like even the still you use the word vicarious and it's like sounds like such theological language or whatever, but you know, like in Second Corinthians five, where it says, uh, "If any witness in Christ, they're a new creation." Or also seeing that as a, uh, I forget which translation you probably know, where it says, "Anyone's in Christ, they're in a whole new world." Yeah. You know, and uh, and seeing the vicar, what Jesus as the vicarious man is is what I and what I've been seeing it as is like in Christ is a whole new like world. Um, the new creation is Jesus, and at any moment in time. There's something more real than what we think, you know, we're experiencing. People are like, well, what about, you know, I don't feel like a saint or I don't feel perfect or I don't feel like I'm in the bliss. And and you can live in your subjective experience or you can live in Christ. You know, in any moment we remember that what we've been given in Christ, it's it's literally as, as, you know, and what I saw some years ago was like an overlay. It's like, there's this, there's what we think we're experiencing, but there's also a greater reality called in Christ. And that's what gets me so jacked about the, you know, the vicarious man is that, uh, you know, just because I think I'm having experiences and, you know, and this is where your joy may be a roller coaster if you're basing yourself on that subjective world, but yeah. the objective world is, is Jesus Christ. Like yeah. it's in him. It's, it's, uh, it's not just that he you know, fulfilled the law, uh, or, or, you know, that he did so many things that we couldn't do in, in, you know, giving us righteousness, but he gives us like, uh, you know, one of the things I go over in my book is, you know, we've lost sight of just the simple gospel that Jesus preached, which is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah. You know, Mark, Mark one fifteen, Matthew four seventeen. that, uh, there's actually a whole new world here. And now we're not waiting to go somewhere after we die. We're not, you know, waiting for some great coming revival. But that right now there's a world called in Christ that it's called the new creation. And that's the, the truest life that we have, you know, and and uh, this is where, like you said, it's a mystical reality, because if we walk by sight all the time, we might, you know, well, it doesn't look like everybody's healed. It doesn't look like everybody's saved. Uh, but but we're not those that walk by sight, but those that walk by 
his faith and what yeah. he knows to be true, you know, is what God knows to be true about reality is that, you know, heaven is all around us and within us. The kingdom of heaven is already among us, that the glory is already covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. And so my heart has just been so settled. And one of the other things that I love, and Torrance goes over it. I've been, I've been saying I've been drinking torrents of torrents. Yes. Here. But uh, one of the other things he goes over is that Jesus does this from within our humanity. And, yes. Uh, so, so what's so amazing is that it's not this, you know, we're trying to mentally ascend to some spiritual plane, but that yeah. we're finding glory in everything around us. That that this panentheism, this Christ in all, that Christ, you know, we're we're just seeing Jesus in in everyday situations in our normal life that overlaid, you know, that this water I drink is filled with glory, you know, there's, like there's so much uh, substance of heaven in everything because. Jesus has, you know, uh, who was it? Augustine that said, uh, what God, everything that God assumes he heals. And that when God became a man, he didn't just become a man, but he became, you know, the creator became creation. Like all creation was filled with his substance. And, and, uh, it's hard not to get high when you realize that reality. <laughs> well, absolutely. Because you, you realize that sobriety is a delusion. <laughs> yes. I mean, he's, he's always been here. Jesus, he never left. Man. Yeah, and, I mean, how many of the early church fathers said, uh, you know, the, the, the earth is a bush burning with the glory of God. Yes. And, uh, you know, sort of the charismatic yeah. mindset is, you know, we get into the glory or into the presence of God. Or Exactly. You know, I had an encounter where I went into heaven. No, you just opened your eyes for a little while to see what's been here all along. I mean, way back in Isaiah's day, he said heaven and earth are full of his glory. And I think it's it's good also to to really kind of define what this what this uh, th- these blinders are, because, you know, people, they like you said, they they're having negative feelings, negative emotions. And everybody yes, has yes. dealt with this. This isn't um, uh, something uncommon to the human race. This is the yeah, Jesus problem. knows. Yes, yeah. it's the problem of the fall. Is And, and so we, we, we end up trying to get our subjective experience you know, changed or something. But in reality, it's it's just as simple as as realizing, hey, it, it, it really is. This is fact. What we're talking about is truth. You don't make it real. The facts yeah, are the facts, whether we believe you know, it or not. Uh, it's like one of our fellow Cana professors, Dr. Eric Wilding, said, uh, this is where, you know, so many times people get stressed out um, of the how to's, you know, even when they hear the gospel, they're like, that's great. Now, how do I believe it? Or how do I manifest it? And what Eric yeah. said was, uh, you know, this this gospel, this reality of Jesus Christ changes all of our hows into who. Yeah, and, absolutely. And uh, when, when our focus becomes, oh my goodness, like Jesus has, has mystically united all into himself. Uh, and, and we just start to, you know, look at Jesus, you know, see Jesus everywhere. All of those hows, you know, just happen. You know, yeah. all our, tr- our experience is transformed rather than meditating to get into it, to, you know, reading our Bible more to get into it, fasting or praying or whatever we think, you know, the, I always get asked how to questions all yeah. the time. And I'm like, uh, I love you, man, but there's a place greater than the how to's It's yeah. called who, who. And, and, the, and the first fruits is, is always going to be rest because you, you cease from your own labors and you actually begin to trust that, okay, this, Come on. this, this really is done. That's what faith is, is, is trust. And uh, but we're so geared to, you know, what do I do? What, give me steps. Give me formulas. And and, uh, yes. and that's, you know, the sort of the bulk of what pastoral ministry ends up being. Is <laughs> and the vicarious it, humanity of Jesus, the, his, you know, the incarnation just undoes all of that. If we blows can, it out of the water. If we can just see Jesus, you know, and, and uh, as more than a Sunday school answer, but the living, breathing, you know, you God and man inseparably united. And Absolutely. Just, my God, my God. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he could he could no more remove his spirit from you. He would have to reverse the incarnation. I mean, yes, I love is, that quote. He yeah. is the the union of God and man, and so I think I think defining this. Okay, so if somebody's you know fe- they're not feeling God per se, and, yes, and they're and not so feeling often, high. <laughs> well, and so often people have uh, their packages of what that's supposed to look like. Does it mean I have to flop on the too. floor in a meeting, or does yes. it do I have to bark like a dog? And it doesn't right. it doesn't mean you have to manifest a certain way. I mean, it's it's like exactly my goodness, and and I think you have a, a lot of people that you know they're 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 trying to get into that experience, and, and they'll even turn you know drinking into a work, and they think exactly. you know the 
the weirder they act, the closer they get to God. And it's like, dude, you don't need to help God out with weird. I mean, that, that comes naturally. <laughs> the the anti-religion religion that comes in, yeah. Yeah, so so I think, uh, but it, it still goes back to this sort of humanistic, I, I need to do something to access. And and, yeah. it, and so much deeper than that is the rest that you're already in. So I think defining this um, this sense of separation from God or defining these negative emotions or this what, what we perceive as a lack of experience, I think if we really define this correctly, what we're talking about is the darkness that is mentioned in John chapter one. And I just happen to have this and we didn't plan this. I, was, no. I didn't have this cued, but um, I, I love, man, John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was yes. God and the word was God. Jesus, Come on. It, the, the, the Greek is pros. He's face to face with the father. And you see right from yes. the beginning, this, this union between Jesus and his father. And these two things go hand in hand. Our concept of separation from God is, is completely tied to this idea of Jesus being separate from the Father. But if we realize oh, yeah. we are fully united in the Godhead, and he goes on to say, it says, he was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light oh, yeah. shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it or has not perceived it, has not comp- yeah. So, comprehend what, it. Yeah. So what is the darkness? Well, first of all, what is the light? Well, Jesus is the light of the world, right? He says, we are the light of the world. But right here in the context of John, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. What's it talking about? It's talking about yes. pros, union, face-to-face relationship with That's his it. father. And that, that non-separation, no distance, no delay, complete, full-bore union of glory. Yes. With the Father in the Spirit, that is the light, and the darkness is our inability to perceive it. But your inability to perceive it doesn't make it less real because the light That's is right. shining in the darkness. The light come is still on, here. Come on. Just because we've got a, a mask on, and so th- what do we do, man? We to see the glory. What does Paul say? The glory is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. Yes. So, gospel is the the knowledge of the glory the awareness of the glory whoa jesus his the veil of his flesh was torn all of heaven is open we are in it is done Come on. and as we anchor ourselves in that and, and just be rooted and resting in that that is the key to That's experiencing it, this reality because it's real nonetheless come on yeah you know it's something i found myself saying recently because i you know we do uh pastoral ministry uh, you know, people are struggling with all sorts of different things and they're like, wow, I just, how do I feel more of God? How do I see more of God manifesting in this way or just whatever I need breakthrough in my life? Yeah. And, uh, the, you know, it's like, uh, I've been reminded where Paul said, uh, as Galatians one, that God was pleased to reveal his son in me. Yes. And, uh, and, and this Christ in us reality, even before we believe it, even before we knew about it, uh, it was already there. And just to yeah. say to people, you know what? You, the glory is already all over your life, all in you. Christ is in you. It's simply even just just leaning back and resting and realizing what's already going on within me. What what of God is already like? You know, the communion of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that's all that I'm already included into. Just lean back, take a deep breath, and say, "Oh, that actually there you are, the deepest part of me, deeper than all this." stuff that I've been focused on, all this, you know, mind traffic, all these attempts, these efforts, and just sit and realize, oh, you know what, like, uh, I did experience God the other day in this, or I had this dream, or I had this thing where God was already moving, God was already, I had this sense, you know, it, even with unbelievers, you can say, you remember that angelic encounter you had as a kid, or that time you felt love, or what, Jesus has already been ministering in your life, you don't have to try to get anywhere, just, you know, it, and God comes and reveals Christ already in our lives, Christ already in us. But we oftentimes are just so, you know, just distracted or like you said, with the, you know, the blinders on and, and he's already been closer than our breath, moving in ways that we usually just took for granted or didn't perceive. Maybe oftentimes because they were too natural and human. And we were looking for fire in the sky and he was just moving in that love that was in our heart or moving, you know, Christ within us. So. Absolutely. I think I think with our dualisms, we separate out the supernatural from the natural. And uh, man, we're, we're yes. missing out on 
an infinite life of glory because, I mean, he sustains all things. Holy Spirit is a multitasker. Come Holy on. Spirit's not just dropping you over in a Pentecostal meeting. I mean, yes. Holy Spirit is every maintaining moment. The, yeah. the cosmos, every minute detail of, of all things. He's the Lord and giver of life. Uh, I, I think also, you know, when you start to go down this this gospel path and and, and, and people begin to hear this message that, hey, you're, you're already— uh, in the glory, you're already in the presence. Well, I think some people, because they've been so sort of indoctrinated in an evangelical, like transactional, you've got to do something to get in. Well, well, they their, their knee jerk reaction is, oh, wait a minute, you're you're taking Jesus out of the picture if the glory's already here. And it's like, yeah, my, yeah, my yeah, God yeah. couldn't be further from the truth. Exactly. Look, the glory is here because, because. of Jesus. See, yes. what's happened is you've, you've already taken Jesus out of the picture. If you think that you humanistically have to do something, your faith, your repentance, your fasting, your whatever to get in. No, we're saying, hey, this is all about Jesus, Christ in him crucified. And, and he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This isn't a when, this is a who. It's not a yes. how, it's a who. Come on. Come yeah. On. Yeah. So good. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, it's uh, it, it's been a good chat. I, I know that these Jesus yeah, trips, thanks, be, uh, yeah. If we if we push them out too long, uh, uh you know, we, we're in no one wants to click generation. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we're, we're well, we can wrap it up. Is there any any uh, closing great, thoughts man. you would uh, you'd have to say in terms of just encouraging people and um, man. And, and just the, their experience with the Lord in this way? I mean, you know, I, we have. I think we really. We really touched on it. I mean, we're just we're just revelating on the gospel again today. But just to recognize, I mean, just like the last thing we were saying, recognize he's already in you. He's with you. You know, this is Emmanuel. Uh, man, the, you want to you want to stay jacked up. You want more mystical experiences. Just realize you are in the mystic experience of the ages. Jesus Christ, you cannot get away. If we go up to the heavens, he is there. If we descend to the depths of Hades or whatever you think that is, he's there with you. And, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, so, and, and there's nothing we can do to add to this. He, he you know, it's, it's not our fasting. It's not our fighting yes. Nephilim spirits in the skies or learning the deep secrets of Satan or whatever. Hey, he fasted <laughs> in the desert vicariously and vicariously. the entire world was liberated from temptation and brought to the feast. It's not suffered. what would Jesus do, it's what has Jesus already done. He was a man of sorrow, so we would be a people of joy. He is over all power and principality, and we're so effortlessly united in him. Yes. Uh, my goodness, in him, the, the fullness of the Godhead dwells, the pleroma, the fullness, and now you have been pleromatized. <laughs> 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 That's it, dude. <laughs> Jacked up. So good. So yeah, good. it's it's there. It's there. So let's just keep hearing it. Man, Faith man. comes by hearing. We 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 put it out there. We it preach. Never gets how, old to me, man. How can people old. know if there's not a preacher? Amen. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and and how can we preach if no one is sent? So I'd encourage you guys get get behind Matt. Support him. Keep sending him. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, uh, I'd encourage you guys, if, if you're enjoying listening to Matt, maybe you never listened to him much before, uh, check out Cana New Wine Seminary. We have, as I often say, doctorate-level grace theologians, as well as people like me and Matt who need a doctor, right? So, <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Lord. Can, yeah. I, can I do a little plug, too, here, John? Absolutely. Please do. If you, uh, We're doing our High on God tours, and we're trying to come to all the different regions or whatnot. Um, so check us out at uh, thefirehouseprojects.com thefirehouseprojects.com. You can find all of our events, uh, different videos, resources. You can find the book, High on God, at thefirehouseprojects.com. You can find us on YouTube. Our YouTube handle is You Are Gods. You can find us on Facebook, The Firehouse Projects. And uh, we'd love to connect with you. We're, you know, we, we I love John's ministry and we've received so much from it. And uh, I mean, we're really flowing in a lot of the same veins. We got our own unique flavor. But uh, we, you know, like John said, you know, our heart is just to release the same message over and over like a broken record and uh, and to empower others, you know, in, in different regions to begin to bask in this glorious reality and also to do that with friends and community and stuff. So we'd love to connect with you. Thanks so much, John, for the opportunity. Find us at thefirehouseprojects.com.
Absolutely. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks, Matt. Hey guys, before you go, I was just with Dr. C. Baxter Kruger for a three-day Nicene Creed conference in the UK, and man, it was intense. There was more gospel Christology packed into those sessions than most Christians get in a decade. It was on fire. Well, the Creed is also coming to the USA in October. The American version is going to be in New England, specifically in Massachusetts. So sign up, make the trek over. It will blow your face off. And as we just mentioned, uh, Cana Online Seminary sign-up deadline is coming up pretty fast. You can actually still get the early bird discount for a little while before it kicks off in October. So I figure many of you guys got 10, 20 years listening to non-gospel tripe in churches. So it also wouldn't hurt for you to spend a, a couple of years, two years, at least getting detoxed with the real deal in our weekly online course. You will love it. We've got myself, Baxter Kruger, Francois Detoy, Matt Spinks, Dr. Eric Wilding, Rod Williams, Lily Crowder. It's an easy course, one session a week, but mind-blowing and heart-expanding. Studying at your own pace. Uh, check out the promo video at the end. It's a very spirit-filled and experiential. It's, it's supernatural and theological. What else? Just a couple more events we've got going on. I've got a free event in Poland in September 20th and 21st. I've got a Germany mystical school. It's our only mystical school in Europe for 2019. And it's this month here in September, uh, September 27th through the 29th. And my next mystical school in America is not until January when I come to Detroit, uh, January 2020. Uh, it's also my only Midwest event. So I encourage you lock in a spot super early. And then the first weekend of October, I'm going to be in Seattle at Seattle Revival Center with Godfrey Bertel and Darren Stott. That's going to be fun. And in December, I've got my week-long seven-day gospel intensive in Sydney, Australia called Telos. Now, we did a USA version of this over the summer. It was off the chain. So you can check out the promo at the end of the show. It's a whole week of Crowder down under. And then finally, uh, next spring, I've got a mission trip slash internship opportunity in March 2020 going to Russia and the Caucasus Mountain region. It's going to be our only trip currently open to applicants who'd like to join the team Come rub shoulders with me, have some personal time, and get a taste for both missions and traveling itinerant ministry. Okay, it's going to be a small team. You can visit thenewmystics.com slash intern, get one of the few spots available, and check this out. Plunge into the depths of the gospel of grace and sign up for Cana New Wine Seminary. Explore the heart of the Trinity, the ancient faith, the finished work of the cross. It's supernatural and presence-oriented. The online format makes it an extremely affordable theology course, and it's a rare opportunity to drink from some amazing teachers once a week. Catch the early bird discount rate at cana.co. Tell us the end, objective, purpose, or aim. Jesus Christ is the consummation and summation of all things, the objective of the cosmos. The world was created that Christ may be born. The way we think about God in the Western world needs to be restructured from the ground up, whether liberal or conservative, fundamentalist or postmodern. We need our ways of thinking re-evangelized from the bottom to top. Some folks are aimless with no purpose, others are religiously purpose-driven, humanistically striving for God. But Christ himself is the message, not faith, not repentance. It is Christ and his relationship with his Father in the Spirit, which he vicariously fulfills in us, created in and restored to the divine image, the fulfillment of the law, the end of religion, and by the Spirit, union and adoption are ours in him. He is the restoration of all things, the completion, the end, the eschaton, the omega, the word, the very logic of God, the ultimate goal, the purpose of all human history, the intention, the telos. Pull aside for a jam-packed, week-long, intensive course of butchering sacred cows and proclaiming a straight, unadulterated gospel of grace that is unfiltered by the pagan concepts of separation that have infected every stream of the Christian church. And all of this saturated in a supernatural, miraculous atmosphere. I would like to invite you to a very unique opportunity called Telos. It is seven days of non-stop gospel glory. 
This is a destination event where you'll pull aside for a week and fly in in Sydney, Australia, December 1st through the 7th. It's a seven-day foundations course. It'll be challenging and it'll be intoxicating. Tell us the end, objective, purpose, or aim. Jesus didn't just bring a message. He is the message. He doesn't just invite us into this union with God, but he is the living, breathing, incarnate union between God and our humanity. Any theology, philosophy, or worldview that is not summed up in Jesus Christ and his finished work, as Torrin says, it throws men back upon themselves and their own religious efforts. Telos is about making Christ the lens by which we see everything. He is the Telos. Sons of Thunder runs on partnerships and generous contributions from people like you. If you've been blessed by the ministry and want to participate in sharing the gospel and reaching the poor with us, consider becoming a monthly supporter at thenewmystics.com partners.